I'm looking out the window right now and aware that there is a, a young man that has left his career as a librarian at um, the at California State Sonoma, I believe. Sonoma State University. Sonoma State University. He was, um, he had a very good job. Uh, his mother was a librarian, so he was like really cool with his family. And he came to a point where it was unbearable, the politics in this situation and the fit for his spirit and the the misfit of of focus for this time mm -hmm. and he picked up um, with his partner and moved up here and decided to uh, is living in a what looks like a civil war tent that they have kitted out with a stove they're going to weather the winter in it and he is learning permaculture not every not everybody needs to take this risk. Not everybody can take this risk. But I have a feeling there's a risk for everyone. Because business as usual has gotten us into the mess that we're in. And if hope somehow relates in any way to the continuance of business as usual, we will not see the risks that we need to take to change course. Mm -hmm. Because this, where we are, is um, I don't believe that it it is an expression of the true human spirit. Like somewhere we diverted, mm -hmm. and to get back on track means following some other kind of impulse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's what comes right now. There will probably be more here in a second, but I'm waiting for it. Yeah, that was good. Did you have anything else to add? You seem like you're you're very pensive. You look like you're about to or pensive. Well, I think this is what happens to me a lot: is that there's something that's under the surface, mm -hmm. and I can feel it but my mind doesn't get it. So that's happening to me right now. <laughs> so I know it's time to listen yeah. until it gets all the way up here. Mm -hmm. And it's hard in these times to live in a void when you don't know what to do and you don't know what to say because whatever it is isn't all the way up on the surface yet. And that's a risk to, to not have the answer. <laughs> Well, I think our culture is obsessed with having answers, you know, for everything. And um, we're very uncomfortable in a general sense. It's something we were, we've had this conversation with numerous people throughout the week of unlearning what we have learned. We spend maybe 13 or more years in public schooling and college and that whole drawn out education process. And then once you get into a space like many people were meeting that are wanting to take a risk and that know deeply they have to, that risk includes n deprogramming yourself from the cultural conditioning that we've been, you know, awashed in. And our media is just reinforcing it constantly, constantly, constantly. So it's no surprise that young people are, of course, acting from that place. Not, not, uh, not that it's not beautiful or worth whatever, um, but they're acting from that place of action because there has to be a solution and they're being told there's a solution. So there's never going to be a space open for them to really begin to ask those questions, or most of them at least. That are so required. I have a, um, a, a member of my family who is around, se she's 17 years old and she's really smart and she's been set up to go to any college that she wants to in the whole country. And she has had the gumption to say, um, I'm taking a year off. I'm not 
that real education is going to take place for me in an entirely different way. I'm, I'm going the vocational route. I'm, I am going to learn practical skills that will help me to, um, to thrive and to help other people in the times that are coming. So she's, um, she's learning about timber frame building. She's learning about horticulture. She's learning about welding. She's learning about electrical, whatever you call it. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's her risk, is to just be different and to follow... uh, um, uh, follow a thread that uh, follow a thread that's hers mm-hmm. and that that was not um, um, that was very different from the educational track mm-hmm. that most young people are on not all people are on the track to go to college I'm not saying that but I'm just saying there's a um, it takes it takes a risk to go your own way it does yeah and I think that for young people right now, that is a huge thing because our institutions are not preparing people for what's to come. And a lot of young people know that. And so there's a huge revolution needed here in, uh, in supporting young people for what they're going to face, what yeah. we've landed them with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think in your last piece that you both did for Truth Out... And um, Dar, at the beginning, you talk about uh, that you half joke with friends about living in the apocalypse, which is very true. You do half joke about living in the apocalypse quite often, but uh, <laughs> but you're really what you're saying here is that you're you're um, kind of hearkening to the Greek root of that word, which means literally uncovering disclosure and revelation. And this, to me, what this crisis has always presented to me was like, this is the truth about, I mean, this is always going to happen. If we were going to live in this way, this is what inevitably would come from that. And you've talked about people that have encountered the white, the white people that for the first time, white, white men, seeing how rapacious they are, how greedy and unyielding they are in their just swallowing up the earth. And you know, we, I think we were talking about indigenous prophecies and how, um, you know, you don't you don't have to be a prophet, you don't have to have some mystical, uh, you know, skill to see into the future and see where this is going to lead. You don't have to be a scientist. You just have to. You could just look at the way people were landing on this land and see. Okay, well, this is the inevitable conclusion of this, and they were already sensing that because they were listening and they were seeing it for what it was even before it became to a tipping point, which is where we've already crossed. That, that's exactly right, you know, and that's one of the things we've been talking about since you've been here is, you know, Native American scholar Jack Forbes, who wrote a book called Columbus and Other Cannibals, which should be mandatory reading, especially in this country. But he talks about that Waitiko disease, which is what essentially settler colonialism is, which is... If you have it, it's a psychosis, and it means you you think that it's okay to take another person's resources or life for your own benefit. And that's what settler colonialism slash global capitalism is, even capitalism with a green leaf, because it means you're taking things from the earth. Of course, people like to call those resources, mm-hmm. but you're taking things from the earth, you're killing parts of the earth in order for your own benefit, and somehow that's okay. And so, right, from an indigenous perspective of, oh, hey, these, all these white folks showed up and they're completely insane because they think they can do all this and it's okay. And they have the biggest guns and they're going to get away with it and they're going to just keep doing it and probably figure out faster ways to do it, more efficient ways to do it. And so, how is this going to end? And so, hence, the, as you said, the prophecies are very, it's just logic, you know, it's just like, let's run this out to its logical conclusion. And now we are, we being now um, people living in the end of industrial growth culture, where the reckoning is now n- upon us, not just indigenous people, but everyone, even those that have caused it, the reckoning is upon all of us. And, and you know, the, even the rich people, your money's not going to protect you. 
Yeah, it's funny. I uh, I interviewed Douglas Rushkoff earlier this year or last year. He had a piece come out called Survival of the Rich or the Survival of the Richest, and he just talked about that, this sort of huge disconnect that the wealthy have where they think that they can build these elaborate, very expensive, but elaborate bunkers in some part of the world, and that somehow through their wealth and power that they have right now, that they're going to somehow weather the storm and that they're going to have all the supplies they need. Um, <laughs> and it's just another form of denialism. Yeah. You know, I mean, we've, we've spoken a lot during this program about just all these different forms of denialism. We don't even need to waste a breath on the denialism of the right and the fossil fuel industry, but then the soft denialism on the left. And there's, there's all these iterations and all of it comes down to um, some form of hope. There's some form of hope that's consistent in all of those that's going to prevent all of those people from taking the real risk, which is ultimately looking deep, deep, deep inside of each of ourselves and then trying to decide, okay, what is it now that I most need to do more than anything else in the world, given that we have this extremely finite amount of time left? And it means, yes, considering our own deaths. Yeah. Honestly. Honestly.